Father Augustine, good evening. Well, good evening. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna get the screen. Oops, that's a, <laughs> I'm already having uh, technical difficulties. Let's see, start presenter view. There we go, uh, there I am. See, uh, our, our lesson this evening begins with a practicum in failure uh, demonstrated by yours truly. I'll start by saying that it is a great honor to be here, uh, which speakers always say whenever they begin a speech. But in this particular case, I really am honored to be, well, there and here at the same time. Um, I think I can speak for all Americans when I say that we look across the seas at y'all over in the aisles and just automatically assume that you're older, wiser, and smarter than us, just by virtue of the fact that you have, speak with a different accent. Uh, so, so it's great fun to be here and there at the same time. Um, the title of the talk is Fail, and uh, our patron saint, it looks like, is St. Peter of Verona. I didn't actually know who he was until pretty recently. He just looked like he was having a terrible day. Um, and uh, so I took him as my patron uh, unofficially. I also think it's just brilliant that in Scotland they have appointed one day a year for everyone just to be depressed. And uh, so I'm, I'm with you in spirit, but maybe we can take a quick break uh, just now as we talk about failure and the great saints who lived it. So let's get right, let's jump right into it with a non-saint uh, in fact, this, this guy was anything but a saint, uh, but I'm going to offer him as uh, a sort of base from which to approach our thoughts about failure. In, in one of the great scenes, maybe the greatest scene in Western literature, the enraged warrior Achilles, who is, who is unbeaten and unbeatable, he stands outside his tent on the beach of Troy while three ambassadors beg him to rejoin the battle. And Achilles, who is unmoved by their appeals and their tears, he says, I hate that man like I hate the gates of death now that he has torn my honor from my hands. And it's, it's a shocking passage and a beautiful passage and a heart-wrenching passage. But it's also, for us uh, moderns, I think somewhat confusing because we have trouble thinking, how could... How could anyone tear the honor from your, how could you ever hold someone's honor in your hands? We think of it as something interior. And this in Western literature marks a sort of a move from that interior to an exterior sense or from exterior to interior sense of honor. Um, in the Bronze Age, the Greeks thought of honor in terms of what they call time and kleos. Time being, uh, or sometimes you hear it translated honor and glory. Time was measured in stuff. Uh, the more cattle I had, the more time I had. And if you stole two or three of my cattle, you stole that much time, that much honor from me. Uh, likewise, kleos was your reputation. So if you insulted me in public, you literally took some of my kleos, some of my glory, my honor from me. So when Ag Agamemnon steals uh, Achilles' slave girl, he takes one slave's worth of honor. Now, uh, the reason I tell you this story is because I think Achilles has begun to make a comeback. Uh, I think as a culture, we've begun once more to measure our honor in material, external things. Furthermore, I think particularly the young, <coughs> excuse me, the young have begun to feel it. In fact, I was talking about this with my classical civilizations class, and one of them said, oh, of course I can measure my honor. I have this many followers on Twitter, and, and if, if, if a friend or an enemy uh, takes some of my Twitter followers or encourages them to leave me, I can measure that, right? Um, now, and then... Um, I, one of them actually, I'm a little off script here, but I'm going to tell you anyway, one of my kids brought into class a rap song by Kenrick Lamar, which I don't necessarily recommend, uh, but he starts off by saying, I grew up in this warrior culture, this inner city gang culture, and it was always, it was all about money and, uh, let's see, money and rep, money and rep, I think is the, the refrain. Uh, he says, but now I've, I've gotten out of there and now I hang out with movie stars and politi politicians and and now it's all about money and rep, money and rep, right? So he comes full circle. Um, 
But my purpose really is not to whine about how lousy the world has become, even on Blue Monday, but rather to propose solutions, in fact, uh, to offer antidotes. And I offer these in the form of stories, stories about our favorite saints, my favorite saints. Um, and as I move from one story to the next, I want you to keep Homer's invincible hero, Achilles, I just want you to keep him in the back of your mind for comparison. So we'll just jump right in with St. John the Baptist. Uh, he, he ate bugs, right? And I could stop there, and I think I would have made my point. But, but in addition, he also wore uncomfortable homemade clothing. Uh, he died young, and he was, by his own admission, unworthy to unfasten the sandals of the man who came after him. And furthermore, when his followers decided to abandon him to follow Jesus, he actually encouraged them to do so, saying, well, I must decrease so he can increase. Which strikes me as, as one of the saddest things in the New Testament said by anyone. Maybe a second only to God, why have you abandoned me? I mean, can you imagine any politician, uh, particularly any American politician, saying, well, I must fail so that this person can succeed. <laughs> well, like most of the prophets, John was murdered by the very people he was trying to help, and he was preparing them for a man they would eventually reject and humiliate and execute. And yet, here's the catch, Jesus himself said of this catastrophic failure that he was the greatest man born of woman. He's one of the few saints in the Roman calendar who has two feast days devoted exclusively to him. One is his birth and the other is, ironically, his beheading. Or how about these two, Simon and Jude? Good old Simon. Here, here are two men who owned nothing and about whom we know very, very little. St. Jude was confused with Judas so often he became the patron of lost causes. What's more, the gospel writers themselves can't seem to keep his name straight. John calls him Judas, but not the Iscariot. Luke calls him Jude, the brother of James. And Matthew calls him Thaddeus. Nothing is said about him in any of the gospels, except that he asked one question. And not a very good one. At John 14, 22, he says, what's this? And that's it. There's a New Testament letter that bears his name, but most scholars agree someone else probably wrote it for him. Uh, and we know even less about St. Simon. Mostly he goes by not Peter. Luke calls him Simon the Zealot. Matthew and Mark call him Simon the Canaanite. And that's really all that we know about Simon and Jude. They even have to share a feast day. And yet, they were chosen by Jesus himself to lead his church. They're, they're two of the original 12. Here's one whom you, with whom you are no doubt familiar. Uh, one of my all-time favorites, Edward the Confessor, Saint Edward. Uh, here we come across a, uh, a refreshing change of pace. Edward is a king, right? Was a king. By the standards of the time, obscenely rich, singularly influential. However, generally agreed by historians to have been one of the worst politicians ever, right? Son of Ethelred the Unready, an inauspicious beginning if ever there was one. He was weak, impotent, timid, and famously ugly. In worldly terms, a complete disappointment. During the course of his reign, Edward lost all the money in England. And had his, had his kingdom ruled by, of all people, his mother-in-law, who then turned the country over to a pack of foreign con men. And then, despite his marriage to a famously intelligent and beautiful woman, he never managed to produce an heir, which is the one thing even an incompetent monarch can usually pull off. And here I'm, I venture into uh, controversial territory, but some claim this was his choice because he secretly wanted to be a monk and who wouldn't? Uh, but others claim that his wife just, just could not help him in that area. Uh, so Edward the Confessor left to history 
a reputation for weakness, indecision, and utter financial incompetence. And yet, he remains England's most popular saint. He built the world's greatest abbey at Westminster, and to this day, over a million people come every year to, finish, to visit his tomb. Ah, now here's a local gal. She's actually buried not too far from here, about 20 miles from my monastery. So I visited her tomb more than once. Um, I got in quite a lot of trouble just recently listing her among my favorite failures because she was a Sacred Heart sister and there were some Sacred Heart sisters in the audience. And so I'm not going to give you my opinion about St. Philippine Duchenne as a failure. I'm just going to read you a paragraph from her biography. So if you have complaints about uh, Philippi Rose Philippine Duchenne, St. Rose Philippine Duchenne being a failure, uh, write a letter to Marion T. Horvat, who is her official biographer, who said this. The first order she entered closed. She did not feel realized in the second institution until she came to America to convert the Indians. Then, instead of carrying out this long-desired mission, it was her vocation to be to convert the Native Americans. Uh, she was ordered to teach girls and found convents. The work was more difficult for her because, get this, she learned she never learned to speak English. She founded one convent that failed, and then a second that foundered. The girls were, in her words, ungrateful and worldly. And the sisters chafed under her governance. They made her sleep under the stairs, by the way. That's my own personal edition. When she was finally permitted to go to work in an Indian mission, she was already 72 years old, too old to work or to learn the language. And after only one year, she was denied even that great consolation. She was ordered to leave the Indian mission and return to Florissant, Missouri. And I, I've been there. It's horrible where she died having converted exactly one Indian who apostatized three months later. And yet she was utterly faithful to her call as a missionary. And a century after her death, when the Jesuits showed up to do the job right, the Potawatomi Indians still remembered her as that woman who prayed. Uh, I've got more saints on my list and I'll just rush through them because I want to be sure to leave time for questions, but we've got Moses the Black, who's my one of my favorite patrons, uh, one of the very earliest monks who was a brigand and never quite got used to not beating people up. Uh, St. Theodorus Tyro, who in an effort at ecumenical dialogue uh, burned down the, t or well, into religious dialogue, burned down the Temple of Diana. Uh, this guy, I'll have to tell you, this is one of my favorite characters in the vast pantheon of corrupt popes. Not a saint, Virgilius, by the way, uh, but still one of my favorites. He had a very short reign during the 6th century. Uh, stories complex, but the long and short of it was that he was the lover of the Empress Theodora, who was a monophysite heretic, who had Pope Silvarius poisoned and had him elected in, her, in his place. She also apparently gave Virgilius 700 pounds of gold with the understanding that he would make some changes to the doctrine of the Catholic Church. Pope Virgilius then went on retreat for a few weeks, came back to Rome to make his big announcement. And at this point, from the throne of Peter, he condemned monophysitism, monophysitism and excommunicated the empress. Now, he had to know this was a bad idea. The empress had had the previous pope killed and had gotten him elected in the first place. So it was a small thing for her to get rid of him. But three years of torture didn't change his mind. And on his deathbed, the broken old Pope, the broken old Bishop of Rome, managed to whisper right before he died, do with me what you wish. This is just punishment for what I have done. Go ahead, keep me in captivity, but the blessed Apostle Peter will never be your captive. Uh, there's uh, Blessed Justus Takayama Yukon, who said, I fight not with the katana, but with the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Turned out to be less effective than the katana because they killed him. And then, of course, uh, say all the very many martyrs of the church, like St. Stephen, who, in the words of my students, got stoned. 
Uh, saints like these would have baffled Achilles. Simon and Jude died without Timae or Cleos. Edward squandered his wealth. John the Baptist got his head cut off. No honor or glory here, not even by ancient Greek standards. In fact, these folks come up pretty short by our modern standards as well. And you have to wonder at the church's logic when it holds them up as role models. And yet, that is the logic of the cross. It's a logic which redefines human success and turns wisdom on its head. In the light of the cross, failure becomes promise and weakness becomes strength and the meek and the humble inherit the earth. This is why Nietzsche ridiculed Christianity as a religion of the weak. We come from a long line of failures. In fact, sometimes we, we even seem to take pride in it. Whoops, sorry. Uh, there you go, and I'm, I'm failing as we speak. Um, Mother Teresa when, was asked once uh, if she could possibly hope to succeed in India, where the poverty was so overwhelming. And her answer was simply, God does not expect us to be successful. He expects us to be faithful. And, and this quotation has come to mean a lot to me in my work. Uh, especially in my work in our high school, because in addition to my teaching and praying, I also coach a rugby team, which has not had a winning season in over 12 years. In fact, we only broke even once. We were four and four. And that year, my players tore down the, tore down the goalposts in celebration because it marked the end of a 20-year losing streak. Now, some might argue that a losing streak of that magnitude may have had something to do with my coaching, but I prefer to look at it in biblical terms. You see, God has a special affection for failures, for losers. I mean, if you look at all the losers, for example, in the long, baffling history of our salvation, starting with the Israelites themselves, whose finest kings seem to have a thing for other men's wives, and continuing right through to the age of the apostles, whose first unanimous decision was to run away when their leader got arrested. To our own age and people like St. Philippine Duchenne. So when it comes to losing, I sometimes convince myself that it is a sign of God's special affection for my team. For every failure reminds us that our beauty, our value... Our integrity lie not in our accomplishments, but simply in our existence as sons and daughters of God. Now, that said, I, I feel I should make one thing clear, which is that failure is bad. It, like all forms of suffering, it's a consequence of original sin. And it's natural, even wise, to avoid failure whenever possible. Uh, but there is a tendency, I think, sometimes to romanticize suffering as though it were a thing to be sought out or worse yet, enjoyed. Um, so, or, or, or that, as, though, as though failure were, were just an alternative form of success. But like suffering, failure is transformed in the light of the cross. So just as it was Christ's vocation to die on the cross, so I really believe sometimes it is our vocation to failure, to fail, uh, that, that God chooses to give us tasks which he knows we won't be able to, to accomplish. Um, I also think it's important to distinguish between failing and being a failure. A parallel, I think, can be drawn between sinning and being a sinner. When we say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, we don't mean by that to define ourselves by our sins. We are sinners, but our identity is in Christ. Um, you know, Martin Luther used the analogy of a dunghill covered with snow to illustrate his theology of humanity's utter depravity. We're all basically manure, he said, but Jesus hides this beneath the snow of God's grace. That's wrong because it does not acknowledge our fundamental goodness. Uh, I'm going to skip forward a little here it's because I, I can see I'm running out of time. In my, in my work here at, at the high school. I attend a lot of high school graduations. I don't know how these ceremonies work in Scotland, but here in the States, some kid inevitably gets up and makes a long speech that sounds something like this. 
parents, faculty, esteemed students, blah, blah, blah. It's a great honor to be here, blah, blah, blah. Something about God, blah, blah, blah. Never thought we'd make it, blah, blah. But with a blah, blah education, you'll, prepare to, you'll be prepared to go out and change the world. So follow your dreams and be true to yourself and think outside the box. And remember that you're perfect just the way you are, blah, blah, blah. Thank you. Um, so I'm in closing, I, I'm going to uh, give you my own graduation speech which uh, predictably I have never been asked to give. Uh, and I'm going to follow it with my own little homemade litany of failure saints. Uh, so if you will allow me, uh, as you graduate from this little uh, lecture on failure, parents, faculty, and students of the esteemed blah, blah school, you are all going to fail. Over the next few years, in fact, probably today, you will inevitably fail. You will have your hearts broken. You'll experience loneliness. You'll miss a major opportunity, lose a game, lose a job, lose some money, be abandoned, ridiculed, and humiliated, and scorned. And you, my friends, are, are destined for failure. And that's very, very sad but it's also okay because your God had his heart broken and was ridiculed by his friends. And your God was humiliated and scorned and abandoned. And that means that your dignity is not bound up with your success. You are a child of God. You have been divinized. And in the end, when you lie on your deathbed, as we all inevitably do without trophies or diplomas or accolades, or even your health to comfort you, all that will matter is your existence as a child of God, and that will be enough. That, that will be more than enough. It will be everything. St. Olav, pray for us. St. Drogo, pray for us. St. Mucus, pray for us. St. Hedwig, pray for us. St. Dodo, pray for us. St. Polio, pray for us. St. Willibald, pray for us. St. Barfian, pray for us. St. Mungo, pray for us. And St. Hilarius, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very <laughs> much, Father Augustine. You packed a lot in there in a brief 20-minute talk, but we've got yeah. some minutes away. And <laughs> if I had more to say, but I had to cut it out. <laughs> okay. If you want to ask Father Augustine wait a question in the last seven or so minutes, uh, use the cue and a button. Uh, one question from myself, or it's more of a statement, Father, is I suppose failure keeps us humble. It does. It's the quickest path to humility is a humiliation, uh, which is why I never say the litany of humility because I can't say it and mean it. And, and I, I make enough failure for myself just organically without having to pray for humility on top of it. And you've written a book, on humility called uh, Humility Rules, St. Benedict's 12-step guide to genuine self-esteem. Is that a skateboard under that monk's arm? <laughs> yeah, and ironically, the book has not been a failure. It's, oh, I think we're at 50,000 copies. Um, so humi humility sells. Uh, I, I can't figure out quite, I mean, I, I had hoped it was nice. It was a good book, but apparently it actually is. <laughs> good stuff. And if you're interested in that book, you can find out more at augustinwaiter.com um, or Amazon or Ignatius Press or wherever fine literature is sold. Yeah, use Google. A question's come in, Father. How do you oh. reconcile failure with the responsibility to make best use of your talents? So is failure okay, but if you try? Yeah, okay. Oh, what a great question. I remember watching an interview with Michael Jordan and it was, a, it was a comedian who was interviewing him and was pretending they were clueless. And they kept saying, well, now, Mr. Mr. Jordan, you're a basketball player, right? And he said, yeah. He says, do you sometimes feel like you just can't get that ball in the basket? You know, you, you just can't. You're just the worst basketball player ever. And he goes, no. <laughs> you know, because he's Michael Jordan, right? Humility and obsequiousness are not the same thing. Humility and mediocrity are not the same thing. And it's no act of humility to, to belittle your talents, a, a, which is why I think the, an important part of that little talk is when I say that failure is bad. 
Like you avoid failure as much as you can, but if it comes your way, um, this is, you can see it as an opportunity, right? So I, I think that's really important. What what we, what our friend just asked that um, that you don't confuse it, failure just isn't just an alternative form of success, it, and it's not just an opportunity to learn a lesson. It's um, it's like suffering. It's something you have to endure, but you can make the most of it. It can be transformative. Great question. Another good question comes in from someone good. using the Q&A function on their screen. It says, hi, Father, thanks for tonight. What hi. Your one tip? What's your one tip in developing humility? Um, fear God. <laughs> um, I, I think we've, we've put the fear of God out of our minds, right? Um, I think that know it. Oh man. Well, actually I actually have 12 tips. <laughs> but the first and foremost, I think, is is a fear of God. Not not a fear as in like that God's up there just waiting to hit the smite button on his computer, but but a a, a sense of God's greatness that that puts your own achievements and personality in perspective. Um I think it was uh St. Justin Martyr, who said that when you denigrate your own talents, you do God a disservice. So this, none of this is to be confused with um, timidity or, or half-heartedness. Um, that that, that what humility is about is knowing your place. And, and if you keep God always before your eyes, the fear of God always before your eyes, that's the first, that's the first step and the most important one. Okay, another question, maybe just the last one. Uh, we're running oh, no. out of time. I know. It says, thanks for the talk, Father. And this is from a James Greekin. Hi, James. And oh, I love James book. what? He says, thanks for your talk, Father. And I loved your book, which I guess is Humility Rules he's talking about. <laughs> write, <laughs> three, write four or five reviews on Amazon under other people's <laughs> names. No, don't. I was just joking. But thank you. He says, How do we understand what often feels like failures in the spiritual life with help from these other failures. Oh, wow. I, I wish people, in, in, well, no, no, I better not say that. You're, Scotsmen are apparently, uh, is, that, is that what you say, Scotsmen? Or the Scots are apparently very wise, wise as wise as I anticipated. Um, yes, failure in the spiritual life is very deceptive because I think it's like prayer as long as you're trying, you're succeeding. And, and in fact, often the closer, or this is what I've heard, the holier you get, the less holy you feel. Because like standing next to a very tall building, when you're far away from it, you feel big. But when you get right close up to a skyscraper, you feel very tiny. So the closer you get to God, the more aware you are of your sinfulness. So don't be discouraged by failure in the spiritual life. Um, it's all grace. And as long as you're trying, I, I really believe you're succeeding in spiritual terms. Father, well, that's all we have time for. Thank you so much for your talk. Well, Thank someday I, I hope to make it all the way up there in person, out there. That'd be good to see you sometime. Um, anything else you want to find out about Father Augustine, you can visit augustinweta.com. Uh, yeah, buy his books, leave reviews. <laughs> And in his own <laughs> final words, uh, help me not to fail, not to be a, a practicum in failure. I know everyone's now a graduate from this lecture in failure. And just to finish on your own words, Father, failure is transformed in the light of the cross. Good evening, everyone.